afternoon is going to be given uh, by Sylvia Laban. Um, and the title of the talk is Open the Box, Richard Neutra and the Psychology of the Domestic Environment. Uh, Sylvia is the chair of the Department of Architecture at UCLA. Um, and she's also taught at Harvard and Columbia, the Bell Lager, and the Academy for Angewandte Kunst, and other schools. She's published very widely on contemporary and modern architecture, and her book, Richard Neutra and the Environment of Psychoanalysis, is itself going to be published next year uh, by MIT. She's also currently a fellow of the American Psychoanalytic Association. I'd like you to welcome, welcome Sylvia. Um, I want to begin, is this in the right place? Always oh, something very intrusive about these large, pointy things. <laughs> um, I wanted to begin by recalling a, a remark that Tony made yesterday um, in the question. So it might have been a, a kind of offhand remark, but um, I want to take it seriously for a moment. In, in the context of the discussion of uh, the digital world and space in the digital world, he talked about a kind of, um, in fact, the collapse of space that would take place in this emergent paradigm and argued that the uh, questions about spatiality in this new realm were in fact nostalgic, that space itself was a subject of nostalgia. And um, I think that that's interesting in a variety of ways, and I think it may in fact be true that spatial conditions in the next uh, sort of digital regime may differ. But I, I think that he also may have left uh, us all with a mistaken impression that space has actually been talked about a lot in modernist discourse. In fact, space is always talked around. Um, if you go back and read um, more or less anything, space produces a kind of anxiety and a kind of uh, closure of discourse. Um, there's lots of discussions about maps and coordinate systems and uh, various modes of representing space, but the kind of swirling uh, uh, um, energy of space itself is in fact the one thing that architectural discourse can never address except perhaps in the context of horror vacui. That's a, that's a one long discussion. So while for architects, particularly in the modern period, they, they seem to claim a space as the, cent as the central issue to their discipline, in fact, I think that claim is a, is a symptom that we need to pay some attention to because it seems to be a claim about a lack that can never really be addressed directly. And in fact, as these discourses, the primary effect of these discourses in, is, is in effect the deflation of space. And when you deflate space, you end up with um, the techniques of the architect, the plan, the section, the elevation, and so forth. And so I think that um, in some sense, what I want to try to do this afternoon is um, reinflate space uh, a little <coughs> bit, um, which um, uh, I, I think that actually um, Mark, at the beginning of this conference, uh, when he talked about the psychosexual development of space, um, for me that was a kind of act of inflation, and new possibilities there started to be uh, generated. But what I'd like to do as, a, as a, maybe a point of continuation is to try to reintroduce into that process of, uh, of reinflation the problem of objective space. Um, and to try to see, because these are architects here, presumably some of you, and not all psychoanalysts, um, <coughs> how one might reorganize the relationship between subjective and objective space. One of the ways that I want to do that is to consider um, psychoanalysis, and this is, my paper will be somewhat expository and didactic, and I hope you'll um, excuse that, but to consider it um, in rather more instrumental uh, terms and to try to think of it as a kind of technology of the spatial imagination. And in order to do that, I want to look 
um, uh, at the moment of the historical implantation of psychoanalysis into architectural culture. The, the implantation is not something that we're initiating now, but in fact has a history. And that when one starts to look at that, one runs into various um, things, and that's where I'm going to go. Um, let me just also preface this by saying that uh, when you start looking at this question of historical implantation, you start to run into a few crackpots, and um, rest assured, that's, uh, that's what we'll be talking about um, for the next few minutes. Um, so again, to sort of repeat this provocation, I think it's fair to say that uh, modernism, under which we might uh, subsume psychoanalysis in space, is under assault today, both from a too loving nostalgia and an overly hostile criticality. The nostalgic tend to embrace modernism in the suffocating constraints of a phenomenological regime, while the critical tend to trap modernism's modernism in the landmines set by a semiological regime. A conference concerned with psychoanalysis may, may well want to consider the etiologies of these aggressions, but I will only point to their limitations with respect to our consideration of space. Despite its many contributions, particularly with respect to perception, phenomenology never permitted space to escape its position as a Kantian a priori. While the swirling valences and atmospheric elusiveness of space itself has always seemed to evade the structuralness of semiology. In this sense, space is to architecture that which the cloud has been to representation in the schema put forth by Hubert Damisch. I would like to think that psychoanalysis can help us produce a concept of space that is neither essential nor outside the chain of, of signification, but rather that is ecological and material. Important steps towards this end have been taken by the spatialization of the subject as developed in Lacanian analysis, especially in relation to the mirror stage that we've heard a lot about in the last couple of days. But this discourse still tends to be dominated by problems of representation. Reinventing libidinal energy as a spatializing force generated between organic and psychic phenomena, located transitionally between production and found condition, in other words, psychoanalysis can be used as a technique for transforming spatial coordinates into environments and atmospheres, both with respect to historical and contemporary practices. Reconsidering space psychoanalytically will not only produce regenerative possibilities for architecture, but will also require attention to the historical instrumentalizations of psychoanalysis. These efforts can help open both psychoanalytic and architectural modernity to a new effective sensibility and potentially a new effective uh, psychic space. Um, the effort to use historically specific points of contact between architecture and psychoanalysis to develop a theory of environmental technology must begin by pointing out two truisms that underpin much of modern architecture in the discourses that have circulated through the discipline since the turn of the last century. That architecture is an inherently spatial art and that architecture is the most technological of the arts. These commonplaces have served many purposes, but one of them was to establish the autonomy of the architectural condition. By furnishing architecture with an essence called space, buildings, at least those that claim to have achieved liftoff, were distinguished from the ill-defined and amorphous <coughs> environment of the world. Modern architectural technologies further supported this autonomy-seeking mission by concentrating their effects on moments of contact between architecture and not architecture, curtain walls that separate, mechanical <coughs> systems that filter, and structural systems that lift. Technologies that acted against the spatial essentialism and autonomy <coughs> of architecture, however, also constitute a theme within the modern from trains that contorted spatial perception through speed, or glass that rendered space opaque through reflection, certain materials and machines undermined the sovereignty of the architectural object. Um, this is this funny image of a nuclear bomb going over Manhattan uh, from 1948, and the other is an image from uh, Bannum's Environmental Technology I think these images start to suggest a different idea of space than the classical modern paradigm. The kind of disturbance represented by such technologies intensified wildly in the period after the, sec after the Second World War, as proliferating cars, televisions, airplanes, and spaceships further intruded on architecture's capacity for spatial isolation and identification. 
These popular devices increasingly entangled the pure space of the modern with uncontrollable ecologies and flooded the visual field with an unprecedented number of vantage points. Moreover, as spatial discourses were usurped by envir environmental paradigms, the primacy of the hard sciences of building technology gave way to an emerging dominance of the softer worlds of sociology and psychology. Richard Neutra provides an ideal case study for this effort because of his public attachment to modernism and his private obsession with psychoanalysis. And his uh, Lovell Health House of 1929 and the Kaufman Desert House of 1946 exemplify the architectural consequences of these conflicting modernities. The early house epitomizes the international style by isolating a mathematically quantifiable, quantifiable space through its steel frame and ribbon windows. The regular structural grid defines a determinate volume and establishes an immediate visual coherence, further reinforced by the building's frontality. The gestalt of the building's image resounds through its photographic impeccability. Neutra's desert house, in contrast, presents no dominant facade or volumetric precision. Instead, the house leaks amorphously beyond its physical perimeter through expansive window walls and seeks atmospheric continuity with its environment through indoor-outdoor heatings, materials, and programs. Um, you probably know one of the famous never working features of the Kaufman House was to have radiant heating and cooling that, that existed not only inside the house but also outside the house so that you could create a kind of environmental bubble um, uh, measured through static temperature and humidity that, was, that existed irrespective of whether you were inside the house or outside of it. The classic photograph that you see by Julius Schulman further dissipates the autonomy of the object. The image is one of the most famous architectural photographs ever taken, yet it presents less a building than an ambience for an imagined way of life. Perhaps most importantly, the Shulman view no longer suggests a still image of a stable structure dominated by a single perspective. The photograph instead re reveals several different conflicting gazes looking at and through a fluid environment. The oblique view of the camera, the murky return gaze of Mrs. Kaufman, and the transverse orientation of the outside furnishings. The instability of the Kaufman house, part monument, part found rock, its aspirations to function as a transitional object emerged just as Neutra was writing more and more about architecture's therapeutic role in separation, anxiety, and loss. Thus, buildings relinquished traditional forms of visual coherence as they began in the post-war world to act as producers as new instruments of psychospatial intervention. While modernist architecture and psychoanalysis became widespread, the single family house began significantly to affect the wider public realm by fusing psychic and spatial design and generating a new environmental technology. Although of central importance, particularly to American modernity, the relationship between architecture and psychoanalysis has never been recognized as a productive force in the post-war cultural landscape. Neutra was a key figure in establishing this still unexplored territory. He knew Freud as well as many of Freud's early protégés and spent much of his adult life in analysis. More importantly, Neutra wrote at length on the many parallels between architecture and psychology. Indeed, the quality and tenor of this writing is almost compulsive. The lack of scholarly attention given to Neutra's obsession is both noteworthy and easily explained. On the one hand, it is now taken for granted that the environment has an impact on psychic life and indeed seems a banal observation of pop psychology. On the other hand, Neutra's writings have a frenzied and pseudo-scientific air that has isolated them from the architectural mainstream. Thus, Neutra's ideas have fallen prey twice, first to the idea that they are too popular to be serious, and second to the idea that they are too idiosyncratic to have broad cultural significance. These interpretations, which focus on the debased and the maniacal in Neutra, parallel the fate of psychoanalysis itself as it immigrated to America. Freud considered Americanization, the Americanization of psychoanalysis to be synonymous with commercial degeneration, and his early followers who thought otherwise were frequently dismissed as insane. The obvious example is Otto Rank, who developed theories of short analysis, which Freud uh, interpreted directly as an impact of the economic engine behind American analysis. And, and Rank was another one of these people with whom Neutra was uh, fairly consistently obsessed. 
but perhaps the best known object of this kind of attack was Wilhelm Reich, uh, uh, who, like Neutra on your left, although in a much more extreme way, was both cultishly embraced and paranoiacly dismissed. In fact, their work circulated through the same cultural milieu. While it is likely that they met in Vienna, it is certain that clients of Neutra experimented with Reich's teachings and methods. Yet far more important than the concrete historical connections that link them, Reich and Neutra should be seen in relation to one another because they both developed new instruments <coughs> to act psychoan psychoanalytically and materially on the environment. Indeed, their work shared a pronounced interest in the body, its habits, and habitats, and both sought to transform human ecology through a process of technological and atmospheric materialization. Neutra's house designs of the 1950s can be used to explore this process since they demonstrate not only the impact on architecture of psychoanalytic ideas, but also the degree to which this impact with a material object subjected psychoanalysis to significant transformation. The circulation of these ideas and other cultural forces is particularly legible in the corners of Neutra's domestic architecture. By the teens, modernism, by the teens and 20s, modernism had begun to single out corners as didactic sites demonstrating the possibilities of the new architecture. Moreover, corners often abut windows, which are also privileged sites for exploring the relation of architecture to visuality and to systems of representation. Uniquely in Neutra, however, the corner and the window merge into an indefinite environment, complexly articulated through window walls that offer for the inhabitant not just visual opportunities, but vectors for bodily and spatial traffic between inside and out. In these corners, the traumas of isolation and separation were to be performed, and in these attenuated and liminal environments, space itself was subject to cathexis. As space was thus electrified, it began to behave atmospherically. In 1953, Neutra suffered his second heart attack and took to his bed. He more or less everything that he designed after 1953, he designed from his bed. He did, had a special little table, and one might imagine the impact of that as well. At any rate, writing in bed, one of the he wrote this paper called Woman Makes Man Clear. And I'm going to quote uh, some part of it. No man becomes so fully clear to me as he whose woman I have seen. Adolf Loos was pale, sicklish, and wrinkled looking. But Loos was always surrounded by young and beautiful women. Women in the house, in the kitchen, in the living room, the bedroom. It always remained a puzzle to me what these young women exactly meant to him. Twenty years before, he had been involved in a court case of homosexuality. Most probably, he was innocent. Frank Lloyd Wright was fairly innocent, too. There is no man I know who was more like the dream hero of women, but I did not see him worshipped as a hero by his wives. In fact, hero worship came to him more from young men. This is remarkable and contrary to all fair expectation. I cannot interpret it. For Gropius, woman has played perhaps the smallest role, smaller even than to Le Corbusier whose late married wife has been the simplest character and perhaps the best cook. <laughs> Mies has aroused admiration in very intelligent, worthwhile women, but he goes his way hardly perturbed, I believe. For some, it is very hard to take. Eric Mendelssohn told me, I must conquer my wife daily. This is my enjoyment. <laughs> <laughs> It's really kind of astonishing, isn't it? Um, <laughs> as to femininity, Mendelssohn appeared more determined than any architect I have ever seen. Schindler had a uniquely sweet smile under his little mustache <laughs> and always seemed to intimate a little erotic conspiracy without consequence but promising. <laughs> Schindler would, hi would hire neatly built girls from the Academy Model Mart and draw them in the nude. And he accommodated them, giving willingly, or shall I say yieldingly, of his time at all hours. He would deeply look into eyes, prepare and serve coffee, make love, sit in cars through the small hours of the morning, or climb under the car and fix it for the lady. 
uh, I have no swollen head, whatever, no self-flattering. Still, what ca might characterize my own relationship to men and women? And if women are characteristic mirrors of a man's behavior, what may I have to suffer if this test is applied to myself, confidentially speaking, to this private paper with a pencil? In spite of being most informal, not leonine, not monumental at all, I grow to heroic dimensions, particularly to women. I make no bid for this. It happens unknowingly. But this is what happens. There is a tragic touch to the heroism, I assume. That's just a small bit. <laughs> and uh, this very odd, uh, roughly 20 or so page litany of the sexual prowess of modern architects was never published, but the text typifies Neutra's <coughs> complex relation to psychoanalysis. On the one hand, the text is quite superficial and anecdotal. There is no sustained analysis of either sexuality or itself or its relation to architecture. On the other hand, the relation between the sex drive and creativity through sublimation and so forth is clearly a basic precept of Freudian theory that Neutra deliberately related to spatial issues. When Neutra writes of Schindler that his, quote, creative drive in architecture was overwhelming and, and he would work through nights in erotic solitude to evolve his, his often most complicated variations on a space theme, end quote, the libidinal origin of spatial production is clearly implied. And moreover, when Neutra describes Irving Gill as a little troubadour of the American woman, married to a middle-aged California cultist who was rarely in the wonderfully progressive kitchen uh, he dreamed up for her, chore-free, flush, white, and clean, he situated this erotic dynamic in the domestic context. By the time Neutra was writing in the 1950s, in fact, American domestic architecture was deeply engaged in a socially pervasive psychosexual dynamic from which it has not fully recovered. Um, the, the image on the, that's just one of many ads that I could have showed you on the right and on the left is a, a series um, of fashion shoots that were taken in Neutra's houses um, with smoking women and skirts pulled up over their knees and, uh, and so forth. So a great deal has been written about the transformation of the American house in relation to change, changing gender roles. The focus of this important discourse has been the reprogramming and replanning of the domestic interior in relation to developments in women's work, both in the home and in the public sphere. Little attention, however, has been paid to the eroticization of domesticity during the post-war period and to the new architectural effects it engendered. In the case of Neutra, the way domestic products were advertised in American culture at large reveals how sex had become a patent element of domestic satisfaction better than the way he addressed the plans of a particular house. He located, uh, uh, hang on a second. He located bedrooms in unremarkable places and provided them with conventional degrees of privacy, both from the public areas of the house and from children's rooms. I'm, I'm showing you this uh, photograph on the right in particular because I'm intrigued by the presence of the Gauguin there as a kind of sign uh, of what, the, what on some level the architecture is trying to talk about. Yet the spatial excitement of the glazed corners in Neutra's bedrooms recalls the erotic translucency of new products for the bed and bath and voyeuristic pleasures of picture windows as represented through photography and advertising. Much of the current fetishization of Neutra is in fact a longing for a sort of architectural Viagra. Um, this is, uh, the Neutra houses now in Los Angeles are the subject of a major sort of chic revival, particularly for the Hollywood industry. <laughs> and um, I spoke uh, some months ago with a realtor who basically specializes in this stuff and described a prospective buyer coming into uh, a Neutra house exclaiming that the house made her tingle. As the popularization of psychoanalysis foregrounded the demands of the id, sex not only sold new products, but also transformed what the public expected to receive from house and home. The smells of mom and apple pie were slowly replaced by images of vixens in the kitchen. Indeed, despite like the plexi dream suite on your right, which was more or less done at the same time as this image of psychoanalysis taking place on the battlefield in World War II. Indeed, despite the wary reception Freud received on his trip to the U.S. in 1909, by the end of the Second World War, psychoanalysis had become an American success story. A burgeoning audience of analysands and a veritable army of new practitioners 
were transforming psychoanalysis into a mainstay of everyday life. American belief in happiness as a chicken in every pot and self-improvement as a Puritan social responsibility began to merge with psychoanalytic notions of libidinal resolution. These developments came to define the house as a mirror not of society or of the family, but of the self. This newly structured subject would expect to receive and would in fact ultimately demand nothing short of psychosexual resolution from his domestic realm. Neutra put it succinctly, capturing both the complexity and the impossible banality of this development. A good house, he said, is the, and I quote, is the fulfillment of the search in space for happiness. The single family American home, long since the object of many cultural demands, was becoming a transference object in a new psychoanalytic process. The residential combinations of walls, windows, and doors was no longer merely a space to contain and regulate domestic relations, but was an environment which was to produce pleasure itself. While the growing influence of psychoanalysis was necess necessary to build up these expectations, a critique of Freud was equally necessary. The theory of drives, and here comes the didactic part for those of you who are not so familiar with, with this, was the primary conduit Freud had established between the body and the unconscious. But the drives were fundamentally part of the psychic rather than the physiological apparatus, particularly as Freud's work developed over time. Indeed, the radical nature of Freud's contribution derives precisely from the degree to which Freud moved away from neurology and lifted, in Starobinsky's terms, lifted the unconscious out of organic life. This separation, however, also lifted psychoanalytic concerns out of the material domain of architecture and the traditions uh, um, out of the material domain of architecture and the tradition of therapeutic architecture based on 18th and 19th century notions of psychic hygiene. While Neutra believed that the notion of environment as understood by psychoanalysis um, and that used by architecture were contradictory or excuse me, Neutra believed that the notion of environment as understood by psychoanalysis and that understood as understood by architecture were contradictory. When Neutra told Freud he wanted to study architecture, and I quote Neutra here, Professor Freud would only smile because to him the formative and molding influences of the human mind were primarily human relations. I, on the other hand, could not possibly study architecture if I were to subscribe to this view, end quote. Neutra neither rejected the psychoanalytic outright nor returned to an architecture that treated psychic phenomena in pathological, moral, or purely physical terms. Instead, Neutra seized Freud's portrait of human relations and infant development and repainted the emergence of psychic life as part of a larger ecology. Um, this is a mother nursing in a car on the left and a uh, mother from a trip to uh, the East also nursing. The images and discussions about nursing mothers are one of these kind of pathological themes that runs through Neutra's work all the time. So this is one of the things he has to say about it. Let us take a most intimate human relation, which may be formative. For instance, let us consider a baby held by the mother on her arm. Let us note how it is supported with her right palm at its bottom, while her left lower arm tenderly supports the shoulder and also the baby's head just a little. She starts suckling it. This kind of relationship of a mother suckling a baby I would consider a very self-dependent primary thing. Neutra plays a bizarre experiment with this psychologically potent scene. He imagines slowly raising the temperature that surrounds the mother and baby and doubling the humidity content of their habitat. Ultimately, he hypothesizes, quote, that the baby will fall off the nipple and the mother is not even going to notice it. <laughs> Conflict and friction in the form of separation has been introduced into the relation between mother and child, but a conflict that is physiologically rather than oedipally induced. With conflict redefined in this way, the contradiction between psychoanalysis and architecture as Neutra understood it is resolved by a new notion of environment that establishes continuity between material and psychic energy. Wilhelm Reich was absorbed by a parallel operation of psycho-environmental analysis. Traces of this interest can be seen uh, in even his early work when Reich was still one of Freud's primary protégés. In his work, I'm sure most of you know that he was 
sort of more or less kicked out of the Freudian circle as he started experimenting in strange ways, went to Scandinavia, came, of course, to the United States, um, where in the end he ended up uh, in jail and had all of his books burned in a kind of um, uh, horrific recollection of the, uh, um, of the 1930s in Germany. But in his early work on character analysis and resistance, Reich became interested in what he called body armor, those various bodily expressions, movements, and tensions that strive to protect the ego. This was a kind of thing that Neutra uh, became very interested in. Uh, these were some of the um, kinds of bioelectric libidinal experiments uh, you see on the right that got him into a bit of trouble. And on the left is an image from the, the, the famous 1971 film, W.R. Mysteries of the Organism, and it's a, this is a still of a shot of Reichian uh, therapy, which had to do with kind of physical excitation of the genital region in order to dispel uh, uh, libidinal energy, which was the cause of neurosis for Reich, uh, not, uh, not its symptom. So another of Reich's preoccupations equally influ influential, but that would ultimately lead to the schism with Freud, involved genitality and what Reich called orgiastic potency. So Reich, uh, uh, Reich saw sex as an energy exchange, whereby genital excitation was ultimately redistributed and dispelled through the entire body. In an orgiastically potent individual, the amount of, quote, energy stored up in the organism prior to orgasm and the amount that is released during the orgasm are equal. For Reich, any remaining or unreleased tension is the energy source of neurosis. Although even in Freud's work, the libido is considered a quasi-bioelectrical quasi phenomenon, Reich took this physiological stance further, hoping to establish a quantifiable and hence scientific basis for the libido. By 1940, Reich had discovered what he called orgone energy, a neologism derived from the words orgasm and organism. He established a laboratory and institute in Maine, Organon, where he began to study the energy not only of sex and bioelectricity, but of radioactive particles and of the atmosphere and landscape itself. This is the lab downstairs and his painting table upstairs. It was this universal energy that Reich called organ energy, the study of which he called organomy. He ultimately determined that orgone energy could alter ecosystems, making rain to transform deserts into habitable environments, could cure cancer, and could even act as a general antidote to nuclear radiation. To this end, Reich designed and developed the, or uh, developed, uh, the orgone energy accumulator, popularly known as the orgone box. Starting in 1940, Reich had human-sized boxes made by a combination of primarily organic materials, which both possessed orgone energy and absorbed it from the atmosphere, and secondarily metal, which deflected and, and directed this energy. These boxes made of cotton, glass, wood, rock, polyethylene, steel wool, and galvanized sheet metal would collect and intensify orgone energy, passing it on to the subject within for a generally healthful effect on the blood and body tissues. The orgone box was popularly thought of as a device that raised one's orgiastic potency and sex appeal and conservatively accused of leading to anarchy. Indeed, an article published in 1947, The New Cult of Sex and Anarchy, linked the orgone box to a wave of bohemianism that was sweeping, of course, California in particular. These bohemians and anarchists in California were Nortra's clients and they turned to him in droves because he promised to give them architecture that, like the orgone accumulator, promised climate control, better sex, improved health, and happiness itself. These were the comprehensive satisfaction that Neutra claimed he alone could provide. In his essay, Woman Makes Man Clear, Neutra was evaluating the orgiastic potency of his colleagues based on the relationships between these all-male architects <coughs> and their women. Evaluating the professional's capacity to make architecture that benefited biological, physiological, and psychological complexes in relation to sexual satisfaction, he concludes with, Neutra concludes with the assertion that he was more beloved than anyone. Now, Neutra's clients, Neutra's intercourse with clients, was safely surrounded by an architectural prophylactic, but his buildings were to provide actual bodily pleasure. Um, the woman on the left here, uh, this is a current photo of the, uh, of 
the one on the right is one of the photos from the 1950s. This is Josephine Chewy, who was a poetess and once married to Gregory Ain. Um, she was part of, she was a, still is a Krishnamurti devotee. Um, she was part of the first group that experimented with uh, Leary on, on the use of LSD and creativity and um, was an orgone accumulator box uh, user. Um, the key to this production involved the relation between inside and outside. The smooth and happy continuity between inside and outside is often assumed to be the hallmark of post-war <coughs> architecture, derived ultimately from Neutra's employer, Frank Lloyd Wright, and his representations of the American landscape. But Neutra rejected the representation of nature and turned instead to an erotic coupling of interior and exterior. The shift from Wright's moral and metaphorical nature to Neutra's appetite for the sensual pleasure had an intermediate step in Reich's own building in Maine, now on the National uh, Register of Historic Places. The Oregon Institute um, had various functional, functional requirements related to Reich's use of scientific instruments, but was also Wrightian in its general massing, in its local use of stone, and, and so forth. While developing the Wrightian idiom, the architect was instructed by Reich to design a building that could, quote, not only serve a very practical scientific purpose, but was also to be representative of the scope of the work, close quote. To that end, Reich wanted nothing to obstruct the view through the windows and desired large open air porches to permit experimental work in the open. This easy visual and atmospheric interaction between inside and outside characterizes Neutra's late work, as does the diminished use of hard materials such as concrete and metal in favor of more wood and stone. This, for example, is the Tremaine House. But even though Reich spoke with his architect in terms of representation, the nature at stake in Reich's work was like the clouds in perspective beyond the regimen of visual control. The Reichian episode in architecture's long negotiation between inside and outside more productively demonstrates two unprecedented phenomena. Architecture's establishment of a new intimacy in its engagement with the environment, and architecture's invention of a human subject understood in psychophysiological rather than platonic or mechanical terms. These developments came to a climax in the American desert in 1953-54. <coughs> With a combination of paranoia and foresight generated by Hiroshima, Reich had developed extreme anxiety about the devastation being wrought by everything from atomic radiation to UFOs. As part of uh, uh, his continuing experiments on the healthful and restorative effects of orgone energy, Reich traveled to Arizona with his cloud busters that you see here in an effort to produce rain and purify the atmosphere shot this orgone energy up into the air, and <laughs> voila. So Reich's therapy, this was environmental therapy for the arid terrain of the, de of the desert, to parallel what he called the emotional desert of modern life, involved attempting to introject the elusive cloud into the cultural and psychic environment. Neutra, too, was driving around the western desert in 1953 when he wrote Woman Makes Man Clear, traveling between the sites of several houses he had under construction. Like, like Reich's cloud busters, Neutra expected these houses to transform their local ecologies and fantasized about a time when weather, quote, weather makers or artificial house climate installations might be found everywhere and whole neighborhoods might go underground with windowless apartments befitting an age of atomic warfare. Perhaps most, in, if you can read any of the text, you'll get some more of his thoughts. Perhaps more importantly, as Reich arrived in Arizona, Neutra was putting the finishing touches on survival through the through design, the publication in which he developed most fully his ideas on what would become environmental psychology. Although the American desert has been considered the quintessential modernist space, it was precisely in the desert that modernist space was transformed, becoming, and I'm quoting Neutra, not just an abstract concept of mathematical physics, but a throbbing psychosomatic phenomenon. Space now included the energy of the drives, the energy of cathexis, and the atmosphere of the cloud. By 1953, Neutra's houses had, become, had been fully transformed into boxes whose walls and planes dynamically slip and slide as, as if moved by some unseen source. In place of steel, concrete, and, alu and aluminum, these later houses were all built of increasingly ergonomic materials 
that established the very fabric of the architecture as biogenetically productive. Water became a progressively more central material whose proliferating reflective surfaces along with glass and mirrors transformed these structures into architectural energy catchers. Being in such environments was meant to activate according to, to Neutra vegetative functions, involuntary sensory responses that Reich thought of as the biophysical basis of pleasure. If the Lovell House focused on the inner workings of the human and architectural organism, the steel frame acts as a structural equivalent to sturdy intestinal hygiene, Neutra's post-war work further embraced the psychic materiality of these bodies. His later houses do not just provide a place to eat macrobiotically and do calisthenics, but claim to enhance what Neutra called psychophysiological wholesomeness. With this development, Neutra offered his clients a newly conceived architectural choice. They could opt for houses designed, quote, as life-supporting, life-protecting parcels of a wider setting, or they could end up in the psychiatrist's waiting room like nine million unhappy Americans each year. Many of Neutra's clients of this period share the profile of Orgon box users, vegetarian homeschoolers such as the Logars, that was some of the houses that you saw before, uh, Josephine Chewy here, or uh, the Moors, this is the Moore House in, uh, in Ojai, who were also followers of Krishnamurti. But what most significantly unifies this collection of otherwise peculiar characters is their quest for therapeutic self-improvement, all based on ideas of psychophysical parallelism. Neutra's clients believed that their psychic health was to be improved by uh, domestic contact with an environment physically saturated with natural energy. The houses of this period might well have come with the following instructions about how much time one should spend in an orgone box. This is right. One should continue with the organotic irradiation as long as one feels comfortable and glowing. The sensitive person will, after a while, have had enough. This manifests itself in the feeling of nothing happening any longer. <laughs> It is explained by the fact that in a truly self-regulatory manner, the organism will only absorb as much orgone energy as it requires, end quote. The houses, in other words, were meant to make you tingle. The architectural techniques Neutra deployed to saturate space with enough energy to explode it into an environment concentrated on the glass corners lo located significantly in the public rooms of most of his post-war post houses. In these corners, two planes of floor-to-ceiling expanses of plate glass join in a mitered edge to produce a glazed environment of intense spatial ambiguity. Oscillation between opacity and transparency, interiority and exteriority, solidity and fluidity generates perceptual confusion. These psychic and visual effects of what Neutra called throbbing intensity are further multiplied by the accumulation in the corners of a series of architectural details spider legs, these rafters that continue off the edge of the house, and ceiling beams uh, to the exterior displace and confuse the location of structure. The use of glass represses the distinctions between walls, doors, and windows, combining visually as well as functionally these normally distinct architectural elements. Large exterior overhangs prohibit reflections from forming on the glass surfaces. At night, exterior lights maintain surface transparency and thus spatial continuity. Materials move without interruption from inside to outside and across both floors and ceilings. Even, even the photographs taken by Schulman, such as these, under the direction of Neutra, never frame views of the house, but rather look through the building with dynamic vision. Finally, mirrors placed strategically adjacent to windows multiply ad infinitum these elements of atmospheric ambiguity. High modernism had, since the earliest years of the century, fantasized about the transformative power of glass structures, but for the most part, the goal of architects had been to produce clarity and purity. And if visual complexity was produced or even sought after, spatial precision was always a precondition. For example, Le Corbusier described the need for what he called window walls, and despite his interest in their impact on visuality and structures of representation, he foresaw these elements as static structures sealing the interior into a quantifiable volume. Instead, Neutra's corners suggest an amorphous leak in the structure of the house, a topological billowing of a domestic membrane that creates a highly indeterminate and almost viscous environment. 
Neutra maintained that in these corners, pulsing with what Reich would call orgone energy, architectural physiognomy would interact with human physiology for to, to produce psychological satisfaction and pleasure. The space of architecture and the energy unleashed by psychoanalysis merged to form a technology of environment and atmosphere. The environmental technology that transformed the American house into an orgone box was meant to provide complete satisfaction, the kind that we all understand to be elusive. This utopian ambition reveals Neutra's commitment to classical modernism and explains why Freud, quote, condescendingly smiled when Neutra thought, when Neutra said he wanted to provide patients with therapy through, quote, environmental impact. And the same naivete probably helps explain why Neutra's residential architecture has become a popular part of the general neo-modernist wave that is washing over contemporary culture. Certainly, Neutra's staunch belief in progress and enlightenment makes him a reassuring figure, just as Prozac offers a stabilizing alternative to the uncertainties of psychoanalysis. However, the most celebrated feature of Neutra's architecture is precisely the corner where instabilities and uncertainties collect and where desires both psychic and organic are projected. Like clouds that escape the semiological and spatial regime of perspective, these corners produce effects of sensibility. Composed of both barriers and flow, they are environments where space is materialized and rendered atmospheric rather than represented. Neutra described dropping by the Nesbitt House in 1953 after it had a new set of owners and wondered why the window walls were shut. This is to suggest the impact, perhaps, of these corners. And I quote, I got up and unlocked a shot bolt at the bottom track of the large sliding glass front and made it glide aside. A multi-voiced shout of joy went to the treetops and beyond into the sky, perhaps to heaven. I hardly could believe it. This lady had lovingly lived in this house for a year and did not know that this glass front could slide wide open. It was like a magic, it was like magic to her, a discovery of a new spring of life, like someone discovering, imagine that he can spread wings and fly. There was wild dancing on the lawn. I received a kiss, several kisses, and we all got drunk. <laughs> an electric talk, Sylvia. It was really wonderful. Um, just one comment and, and, and a question. I, I, I was reminded of uh, Woody Allen's Orgasmatron when you were talking about the organ box. Um, but I think it's a, the, the what, what your, your um, discourse suggested is maybe um, something probably very much needed in architecture. That is to try and sort of understand the notion of visual pleasure in architecture. And I wonder whether, whether you've ever thought of, of, of engaging or taking up what Laura Mulvey has sort of suggested as a sort of as a sort of a, a direction, I mean, how to, to understand the notion of visual pleasure? Um, well, I, I certainly have done in other contexts, but um, I think that I'm trying slowly and perhaps poorly to work towards a way of dealing with some of these questions that really isn't so involved with representation. And um, uh, I think that um, her model of visual pleasure and and uh, scopophilia is very useful, but it, but it is really involved with problems in, in representation. And um, on some level, other people have done that work, and the, the work of uh, I introducing her into architecture has been done. And to try to think um, some of these spatial conditions beyond the, cons the, the, the confines of representation, w w without, of course, returning to some essentializing paradigm, um, is the kind of thing that I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to do, or in part to do. Um, it 
seems that some of the Neutra's clients were involved in various um, oriental meditative disciplines, um, from what you were saying. I was wondering whether, to what extent, or if at all, um, both Reich and Neutra um, were aware of any oriental philosophy. It just seems that the, 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 con the concept of organ seems so, so close to qi or ki in the Chinese or Japanese. Um, well, I don't know uh, about Reich. I, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on Reich in that sense. I can, only ref I can only say that the standard literature on Reich doesn't really bring that up as an issue. Um, I, let me say that I think that I think that Neutra himself thought that a lot of his clients were pretty nutty. And um, so uh, Neutra was in many ways a very staunch upholder of the Austrian of Austrian bourgeois culture. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I could send you copies of lectures that he gave at Krishnamurti's school in Ojai and, and that kind of thing. So he clearly was aware of it um, and circulated in that world in some way. Um, but I don't think that that's really um, uh, the, the kind of thing that was important to him. I mean, it, it's funny, his relationship to psychoanalysis is very complicated. He, he um, he was very good friends with Ernst Freud, the Freud's son, and um, uh, had, a, had a, a, a troubled child who he took to Freud for evaluation, and he himself went into analysis f only for the first time in the, in the early 30s. And there are letters from friends of his trying to convince him not to do that because they thought of psychoanalysis as a very um, dangerous and, and uh, scary practice. And it was funny to come across that to real, you know, to, to to try to remember what, in terms of everyday life in the 1930s, psychoanalysis meant, meant particularly in, Ameri in an American context. And of course, by after the war, psychoanalysis as practiced in America and as believed in by Neutra, despite his reservations, <coughs> had very little to do with Freud any anymore. Um, but I certainly don't think that it turned into Chi or Ma or any, any of those things. <coughs> Well, I, I uh, would like to ask you to clarify uh, what you said in the beginning about that uh, the discourse of modernism is in fact more um, speaking, more talking around space than it is about space. Because, well, uh, in several descriptions you gave of Neutra houses, I, uh, well, were very reminiscent to me of uh, the way that uh, Siegfried Gideon is talking about modern architecture in space, time, and architecture. So I'm really wondering where you would like locate the difference between the way you are uh, talking about these houses and the way that also Gideon is talking about well, modern architecture is not about perspective of space, but looking from the counter, having other perspective, well, or, or a series of simultaneous perspectives and this flow and the, the dissolvation of the the corner, the immateriality of the glass, and things like that. So where, ex where exactly is, is this difference? Well, I think that Gideon certainly never got away from the pictorial paradigm. And um, as much as he, uh, I mean, on, on some level, he was really talking about painting, um, uh, even though he was talking about arch sort of the architectural interpretation of painting. That is, I think, what he was trying to do. Um, and uh, I, I think that I was also trying to think about, for example, German empathy theory in the end of the 19th century and lots of discussions about climate and, and, and environment and atmosphere and these kinds of terms that circulate through a lot of uh, writings on architecture. But then when you go to try to pin them down, they quickly turn into something else, just, just as Gideon's really quickly turns into a kind of borrowing of, uh, of an analysis of Picasso. Um, uh, so, uh, um, you know, modernism is, f for example, it seems to me quite different to think of space as a throbbing, pulsing phenomenon. That, that's quite different than to think of it as a volume with shadow and light on it. So um, uh, if you take the Corbusian model as the one that has, you know, Corbusian and Misian ones as the, the, the models that have emerged as dominant, I think I'm just... Uh, I'm certainly not trying to uphold Neutra as any um, uh, 
savior in any way, but just to suggest that our own views of modernism, I think, have been trapped by the same set of, uh, of uh, kind of restrictions against talking about space that the modernists themselves suffered from, a kind of um, uh, you know, being dominated by agoraphobia of one, of one kind or another. I thought you were going to ask me about desiring machines, which uh, might be a whole other uh, topic of